conquered uh, most of the most beautiful women on Broadway. She bought the clothes that she knew Gabi would fancy. Mercedes Acosta was probably one of the first stalkers who ever came around. Came around. Uh, she was obviously enamored of Garbo. She was from a quite a good Spanish family, dressed like a Spanish grandee, always in a suit with a hat, trousers, never a skirt, enclosed her bottom. She was a fabulous lover, obviously. Everybody was wild about her. All her former actress girlfriends with these passionate letters saying what a great lover she was. Garbo tried to escape her in the early days as much as possible because Mercedes de Acosta was very insistent. But I guess if you try long enough, you get there. It was a great ceremonial occasion. Gabo strewed flowers across the threshold and welcomed her in. And then they drove down to the sea. And there they talked um, until the sun came up and um, the romance was launched in style. That was the beginning. For a while, remembered by Da Costa as idyllic, the two were inseparable, indiscreet even. But Mercedes was to find that distractions such as director Ruben Mamoulian would prove too much for Garbo. Mercedes had planned this wonderful expedition to, I think, Yellowstone or uh, one, of, one of the great parks, and had, with great excitement, loaded up everything. So she was waiting for Garbo to turn up at her house so they could take off together. And she didn't come and she didn't come. And Mercedes drove over there and found out to her horror that she had already gone. And she'd gone with Ruben Mamoulian and Mercedes was left high and dry. A careless, nasty thing to do. I don't believe she plotted and planned to be cruel to anybody. Her cruelty was simply a sort of self-obsession and a lack of any consideration for anybody else. Maybe there was a coolness under all the heat, because the passion was certainly intense, but passion is not the same thing as warmth, really. It wasn't a passion to endure dailiness, the warmth of domesticity. Nobody ever had a lasting physical or mental effect on her that would make her say, OK, I'm going to tie myself to you for however long. She liked to flirt with the, whatever woman she had met who made an impression on her, whatever man. She liked to feel desired. I could kill you for this. I'm not worth killing, I'm not. I've loved you as much as I could love. If that wasn't enough, I'm not to blame. In the hands of director George Cukor, Garbo's role of social climbing lover in Camille was warmly greeted by both public and critics. But the atmosphere was beginning to change at MGM. By 1936, Garbo was still one of MGM's top box office attractions, but her disregard for the studio system had not gone unnoticed. We shared a house on the studio Four actresses, Norma Shearer, Joan Crawford, Greta Garbo, and I. And uh, we each one had one apartment there. And I remember Garbo played Walewska at the time. And I thought Garbo was really beautiful. Everything about her was beautiful. Goodbye, Mary. You gave greatly for so little. You have given me much more than love, Napoleon Bonaparte. You touched me and gave me life. You lifted me up. The whole world went away from me. I will never know that little world again. I was having lunch in my apartment with the top producer and I looked out of the window and I saw Garbo. And the studio head said, Ah, oh, she's getting old. She was about 29, 30.
Unsure how much longer Garbo's popularity would last, and with war looming, MGM decided to send up her European image in her first comedy, Ninochka. The scene where Garbo laughs is odd. It's not entirely convincing, but it's a lot of fun. Oh, you have no sense of humor. None whatsoever. Not a grain of humor in you. There's not a laugh in you. Everybody else laughs at it, but not you. <laughs> What's so funny about this? It's not one of her greatest movies, but it's well put together. It's completely professional. And you get the sense that she is having fun with it and playing off of her dour image in a way that she had never done. Go to bed, little father. We want to be alone. Please. You like me just a little bit? Your general appearance is not distasteful. Thank you. The whites of your eyes are clear. Your cornea is excellent. Your cornea is terrific. MGM hoped to capitalize on Garbo's new comedy persona, pairing her once again with Melvin Douglas. But it was one thing to have Garbo play against her image, quite another to reverse it completely. Two-Faced Woman was savaged by the critics. At the end of 1941, just after Pearl Harbor, you have a nation going into a completely different era. And the GIs and, and the nation needed something else. They didn't necessarily need this sophisticated European thing anymore. They wanted something more intrinsically American. When the war broke out, Louis B. Mayer got panicky. And he uh, just dropped all kinds of foreign people. He felt um, it was danger for him to have foreign, uh, foreign actors and actresses. Garbo had uh, just then made a film that wasn't successful. And um, he took advantage of that and let her go, made her go. He was callous. Greta Garbo absolutely did not intend to retire from films. I think she thought she would continue making them on and off. In fact, her arrangement with MGM was that when the proper projects came up, that they certainly would be offered to her. And I think she always wanted to keep that avenue open Garbo had always felt that Two-Faced Woman was a role she should never have been asked to play, and now withdrew from Hollywood until more suitable parts came her way. She said to herself, quite understandably perhaps, I've got enough money, who the hell needs this? The saddest thing is that what she picked up in place of work was a society of uh, not fantastically interesting people. Her friends uh, were the very rich, Onassis and uh, Cecil Rothschild, George Schley. Well, you pay a price for being uh, all the time with rich people. Uh, they're often not all that entertaining in my <laughs> experience. She liked to just be taken care of. Uh, I don't think she liked to spend money. Sometimes her penuriousness backed her into a corner where life wasn't as pleasurable as it might have been. And she was a woman that really wanted to have fun. I don't think she had that much fun. Uh, you got to get out with uh, raunchier people. By the early 40s, Garbo was spending most of her time in New York and began to rely ever more heavily on businessman George Schley, an arrangement his wife, Valentina, appeared to tolerate. There were times when Mr. Schley would escort Valentina one night and Garbo another night. Garbo even eventually moved into the same apartment block, 450 East 52nd Street. And this extraordinary menage went on uh, for years and years and years. 
When Schley died in 1964, any pretense of friendship was dropped by Valentina. Valentina declared that she never wished to see this woman again, yet for the next 25 years these two women lived in the same building. One day, as we walked back, she began to fret. She said, oh, we're so late. Oh, we're so late. Apparently, Garbo had to be home before Valentina would go out. And who came scurrying towards us but Valentina? And Garbo lost it. She held on to me like this and said, oh, damn it. Oh, God damn it. Oh, damn. She just, she just was lost. Um, and Valentina saw what was going on and put a big red smile on her face and strutted past and tipped her hat. A long-term rival for Garbo's affections during her association with Schley was the society photographer Cecil Beaton, who courted her ardently during his frequent trips to New York. They went for a bracing walk in Central Park and went back to his hotel bedroom where she more or less said, get on with it. She had a very practical attitude towards sex and there was no romance from her point of view. In fact, I remember one of Cecil Beaton's friends saying she probably just thought, you know, sex was good for the skin. He was very, very taken with her. He lovingly kept a rose that she gave him above his bed for many, many years. Through 1947 and 1948, this rather strange affair lurched on. He did have two stated ambitions. One was to marry her, and the other one was to get her to return to films. After eight years away from the screen, by 1949, Garbo felt she was ready for a comeback, but she was no longer an automatic choice for a film role. She had done the screen test, she had her cinematographer, she had her director, and she was supposed to meet with the Italian financiers who were supposed to kick in some additional money. And I don't think that she expected to be their dog and pony show. And it fell through because she wouldn't meet the financial backers except in a darkened room. And they obviously thought, well, you know, what use is a movie star who won't be seen? The uh, producers basically told the Italian press that Garbo did not look like Garbo anymore. And it was the first time that you ever saw anything ungracious about her in print in terms of the way she looked or whether or not she even had that magic anymore. And I, she was totally devastated by the experience, left, the, left uh, the hotel in tears, left Rome soon after. To think that her name could no longer guarantee the financing. After then, frankly, I don't think that she had the heart. And she had survived several different transitions in movie making, but this is one that... She just wasn't able to survive. Once you've been away from it for that long, it's very hard to get back in the groove. At the same time, I have a hunch she didn't really enjoy making movies. I think it was kind of a torture all the way through. <laughs> I think the fact that she became an actress at all was a conflict with her nature. I don't think she was a particularly happy person, ever. I think that was part of her melancholic nature. The essential part of being Swedish is to have that air of melancholy. A good part of the year, they don't have the sun for significant parts of the day. It tends to inspire melancholy, and it kind of feeds on itself. She really belonged in Sweden. Mercedes de Costa describes her as a, a Viking's child troubled by dreams of snow. She was always going to be uncomfortable in somewhere like New York, even though that offered her a kind of welcome anonymity. People describe her as this kind of ice queen recluse, but I don't think she saw herself in that way at all. And I think she was greatly relieved to be away from films. She just hated the whole thing so much, and she was so essentially shy in herself that she gained this kind of incredible stature as this sort of odd sphinx-like figure. I think if she'd given an interview, it would all have dissolved very quickly. <laughs>